Welcome to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Our mission is to bring you discussions on a wide array of topics in the coaching world to grow players on and off the court. You can connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and also reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Now, here's your host, Coach Mike Hernandez. Here we go. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining us here for another episode. Wherever in the world you're listening to us from, whatever platform you're listening to us on, thank you guys so much for the continued support, all of the kind messages, all of the love that you've kind of shared this show uh, and showed this show on social media. Really, really appreciate it and really, really, really appreciate all of the, the support, especially for those of you who've been with us since the very beginning. Really, really special shout out to you guys in particular. Now, when I interview a lot of guests, uh, one of the real cool things that a lot of them bring up is they talk about uh, mentors that they've had. They talk about coaches that they rely on or relied on who helped kind of show them the ropes of coaching and have given them guidance and support throughout their journey. And I've also had the privilege of talking to some guests who've talked about people that they've mentored and how they've kind of started their coaching tree and had former players. And now that they kind of coach and mentor them as they enter the coaching world themselves. And I think that it's really cool that so many of those systems exist. And I think that it's definitely worth dedicating its own episode to, which is the concept of using your mentors, finding success, uh, rel- what you can use them for, how you can take their advice, how you can still be your own coach, but also take in the advice that you're given from mentors. And I think if you're a young coach listening to this, there's a lot that you could learn about what kind of things to look for in a mentor, what kind of questions to ask, the process of using a mentor correctly. And if you're a more experienced or more veteran coach, then you can maybe use this episode to get some ideas on how you can help uh, maybe people on your staff or younger coaches that you know to get them ready for the crazy but exciting profession that is uh, being a basketball coach. So very happy to have on to discuss this and kind of share their experience with mentors. Uh, Coach Cameron Manning, all the way out in Florida, uh, girls basketball coach near and dear to my heart as well. Coach, thank you so much for joining us here. How are you? Hey, thanks a lot. I'm I'm excited to be here. I'm I'm having a good time. We're getting our version of a cold front, which will make a lot of people in the north mad. So yeah, I won't I won't bring up any degrees or anything. Uh, like your your your, your uh, school isn't it literally out in a place called Winter Haven? Yep. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, we pay for it in the summer a little bit. Me and Phoenix, you in Florida. So you sure. know we can we benefit now. This is our time to to puff our chests out a little bit with the weather. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, coach. Uh, let's talk about your your coaching journey, your basketball journey. Where where is the game taking you? Uh, where where's your coaching journey taking you to uh, where it is you're at right now? Sure, absolutely. I um so I I got into the coaching side actually pretty early. Uh, I was playing middle school travel ball, uh, and really made the decision to turn to coaching at about the age of thirteen. Uh, so I'm. 32 now so I really made that decision while I was playing I ended up playing through high school but I really found the love for basketball on the coaching side more so than on the playing side I knew I knew I was capped as a player and Mm -hmm. I knew I was much more enthralled with the the studying and the scouting and the the game planning and everything from the coaching side I was just I was just kind of hooked from that at an early age. So I mm. uh, had the opportunity to coach the middle school travel ball team that I, I played for when I was in high school, uh, which is where my my first mentor came in to be. And we'll, I, we'll get into that. And I uh, had the opportunity to be a JV boys high school coach, varsity girls assistant coach. I was on staff for a year, uh, almost two years at Southeastern University down here on the women's side. Uh, I had an opportunity to do that, which was amazing and, and uh, opened my eyes up to a lot of things. And, and then most recently, I'm, I'm getting my first stint as the varsity, in my, in my own varsity head coaching role uh, for girls basketball, which is really where my heart is on, on either side of basketball. My heart lies on the girls' side. So, uh, just really excited to to have this opportunity and 
you know, everything I've, I've been able to do and, and the ways I've been able to grow my, my coaching career is ve- has been very interesting when you look, when I look back on it, uh, you know, when you tell your story, you just kind of, oh, hum through it. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, in talking to people and, and they bring up certain things, I'm like, man, I, I really am kind of blessed to have this, this journey that I've been through. And so, yeah, it really started at the age of 13. I felt I got my first scouting report and set in on the first coaches meeting for game development. And, and I was hooked, Young man. Age. I wanted to be a coach. <laughs> so you mentioned that your uh, love is, is on the girls' side of the game. And as somebody mm-hmm. who's coached girls for 10 years, that that's that, that warms my heart to hear you say mm-hmm. that. But I think that uh, – and I've asked this question to other guests as well, and I wanted to get your thoughts on this. Um, also, that I know that a lot of guys are a little bit uh, hesitant or a little bit unsure mm-hmm. about jumping into the girls' game. And I wanted to kind of ask you about what about the girls game in particular is something that, that, that you is something that you really enjoy doing and why is it that it seems like your heart is kind of uh, on the girls side of things? Sure. Uh, yeah, I can uh, definitely answer that. So my, um, the, the very short, simple is two words, Pat Summit. Um, my dad went to the university of Tennessee. Uh, so I was wearing checkerboard out of the womb. Uh, and the first person I remember anything to do with basketball was watching Pat Summit and watching her patrol the sidelines and give that stare and, uh, you know, all the things that Pat's known for and, and the godmother of Title IX and every, every thing she's helped shatter and every ceiling she's helped tear down. Uh, I, you know, I got to watch all that or a, a large majority of it. I really got to, to see it and remember it and live through it and, um, and so I got that at a very early age and, and seeing Pat and falling in love with her and what she did, uh, she was doing it on the women's side. And so that was something that really took a hold of me early on. Uh, and then the more I was around basketball and the older I got and the more I was around coaching, I realized that there is a need. Uh, you know, I'm sure, you know, there, there's a need and, and a, a, a passion for bringing eyeballs to to mm-hmm. women's sports and to girls sports and you know the, all these girls want to do is go out there and compete and they want to go out there and compete in front of people and at a high level and and work as hard as they can to to achieve the successes that they can and and they want to do it at every level from middle school to the WNBA and the more I hung around women's coaches the more I hung around women's players um that really, that really got into me, uh, really, really deeply and rooted itself very early with me. And I just, I realized that, you know, one, two, uh, also uh, girls are just easier to coach than boys. And I don't know if we want to have that conversation. Uh, Well, I'm not going to disagree with you. I don't know how many people want to have that conversation, but girls are just so much easier to coach than boys as a whole. It's just not even close. And I will die on that hill. Uh, so one, they're, they're just easier to work with, I think, but two, there's just, there's that same passion and and fire in them. And it's just, people aren't looking like they are on the boys side and on the men's side. And I, I feel like it's, t- it's high time. We, we start fixing that. Yeah, no, that, that, that was well put. I, I just, I just find that there's maybe some myths or or misconceptions about what the girls game is like or maybe with just what like female athletes are like in general and i think sure. i would just encourage you know any anyone who who has some reservations or some doubts about that you know just just go go find a coaching opportunity to you know work with girls and i think that that you'll kind of be blown away by not not just their work ethic and their maturity but just like how much as you mentioned right how much they just want to compete and get better and and it's it's very competitive on the girls' side, as you know. Very competitive. And I, I think one of the things, too, on the girls' side that I, I appreciate a lot because I'm a very I, – I love building whatever I do based on relationship. And I think on the girls' side, that's something that's very welcomed. And um, they they also want that, whether it's the AD – for the girls teams or whether it's the girls themselves or whether it's the parents or whether it's whoever that's involved Mm -hmm. um, from every level, I think they crave that coach that's going to come in there and build on the relationship side first 
and then get everything else to fall into place as you build those relationships. And that's just kind of who I am at the core. So a lot of my philosophies and, and ways that I just kind of live my day-to-day life really fell into, into lockstep on the girl side as well. Yeah, no, yeah, uh, that's, that's well put. Uh, when we were corresponding earlier, you talked about something that you're really passionate about is is teaching the game. And, and as you put it, you know, not just <laughs> rolling the ball out, so to speak. So I, I'm just kind of curious in, in that as, as you kind of look at the coaching landscape. And I know you can kind of, uh, you know, maybe just maybe speak about your area or, or, you know, stuff that's around you. But do you kind of find that there is like this shortage of coaches who are passionate about teaching the game and just sort of rolling the ball out in general? Or is it just kind of like a general observation or something that you're passionate about? Uh, I think it's a little bit of both. I think my passion for it was um, developed by the environment that I was around. And I do think at the high school level, I think at the high school level in Florida, and I think also in my county, there is a great need for coaches that want to teach and they want to teach the game properly. Mm. Um, I, my county is well known for probably lacking in that area we'll say um you know we have a little bit of a reputation around the state of florida and basketball in that in that respect it is changing i will say that i'm, I'm you know i'm certainly not going to come on here and just bash every other coach and bash <laughs> my county that's that's not what i'm trying to do it is changing there are a lot of coaches that have showed up in the last four or five years that are are changing that tune quickly which i really love uh, and I'm getting to know those coaches and 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 getting to be a part of what they're doing, which is amazing. But yeah, I think there is. And I think I think those coaches tend to find a way to start travel basketball leagues and <laughs> and, and travel basketball teams and find ways to get parents to pay a bunch of money for their kids to come learn how to shoot layups and run a diamond press. <laughs> um that's fine for some. That's just not me. That's not, that's not what I want to do. Those are things you can learn, but I know coaches that have built entire organizations off of right-handed layup, left-handed layup in the diamond trap press. Uh, and that's just not what I want to do. I want to get in there and teach. You have to develop these kids. Uh, they're, they're craving for it at the high school level, whichever side you go to, they are, are almost crying out for it. Uh, and as a coach, I feel like we have obligations and duties when we take up this position. One of those is teaching the game. Yeah. And I, and I think that there is kind of a trap that's easy to fall into. I think this is especially prevalent at the younger levels where you can be a successful coach, at, especially at the younger levels in terms of wins and losses, if that's what you care about, without really... <laughs> teaching the game correctly that's kind of one of the weird things i think about basketball is you can kind of find you know win and loss success but not really teach anything and yeah. or, or just like you said like put in like a diamond press or do something like that and you know look like the best youth coach there ever was but your players don't really learn a whole lot and probably some of the reasons for their success is just because of the development of the players they're going up against mm -hmm. um and it's it's a much more challenging, right? And a much more uh, difficult uh, challenge to teach the game properly. But I think that if we care about the game of basketball, that's that's what we have to do uh, to, to actually be doing it the right way. I absolutely agree with that. Uh, I think, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, and it's with any industry, you know, mm -hmm. not every industry is going to be run 100% perfectly. But I think I think as coaches, we have to have, we have to hold ourselves to the standard of being the teachers and communicating that and teaching the kids what matters in, in basketball and, and, uh, and not just limiting their ability because we don't want to do what I feel like we have to do and are obligated to do because we chose this profession, mm -hmm. right? I walked into the, the high school that I, I coach at, I walked in there and interviewed for it. I swapped emails with the ads. Uh, you know, I I went out looking for that position. Yeah. If I go out looking for that position, I now have an obligation to do it the right way. Yeah. No, I I think that's a that's a great way to put it. All right, we're gonna talk about mentors. So let's let's jump into the mentors you've had along the way. Describe some of the mentors you've had and and what is their role been throughout your coaching journey so I, i'm sure there'll be some some shout outs going on to some people right here so I'm, I'm i'm looking forward to it yeah absolutely i um 
so I'll I'll start with the a couple a handful of coaches that I always looked up to that I never met. I'm I'm not mm-hmm. going to list them obviously as like mentors cuz I never met them so they didn't really mentor me a lot, but I did watch them from a distance and glean some things that they did. So I kind of feel like I should at least mention them. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, watching I got to watch the the back end of Bob Knight, you know, when he was at Tech and they did that uh uh walk on real, you know, reality show or whatever uh that they did with him where it was like one guy got a walk on spot when he was there. Um, but but understanding him and understanding how he dealt with his players and the the misconception that we have from the outside versus when you talk to players that actually coach for night. Um, Summit was a big one. Tara Vanderveer at Stanford was also a big one. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of those are coaches that I watch from a distance and try and pick off information. Carol, Carol Lawson at Duke is a big one. I loved her at Tennessee. I absolutely love what she's doing at Duke right now. Um, and what she's building there. So those are some people that I'm uh, coaches that I look up to really that I've never met them. So I can't mm. call them mentors, but I look up to them and what they did. But starting in elementary school or starting in middle school, uh, I grew up in Daytona Beach. So there's an NAI school, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. I think there actually might be a campus out in Phoenix where you are or in Arizona, I think. Mm. Okay. But their sports campus is in Daytona. And the head coach there is a, is a gentleman named Steve Ritter. Um, and I, I got to know him when I was 12, which you don't really put into, you never really compute those things when you're 12, but looking back on it now, I'm like, this guy's won a national championship at the NIA level. He's in the NAIA hall of fame. He's still coaching and still breaking all these records. And now they're NCAA division two. So he's breaking records and also now setting new records because they've never been in NCAA division two. So his name is everywhere in the Embry Riddle books. You know, he's been there for 30 plus years and I got to know him. I played with his brother or his brother, excuse me. I played with his youngest son. I was coached by his oldest son, who is now the men's coach at UT Martin. Ryan Ritter is okay. his uh, is his son. So that was a, the first family that I really got into with basketball. And it ended up being an absolute gold mine. And you don't know that when you're 12, but looking back on it now, um, you know, I, I swap emails with him and 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 stay in touch with him as much as I can. Obviously, he's in season, so those emails are coming and going a little bit slower. <laughs> uh, which obviously, and and when when they when it, you know when the guys I consider my mentors get into season, I really try and throttle back. They have enough going on; they don't need me there. Um, but they do a really good job of reaching out to me. But he was the first guy that I really got to be around in, and the middle school team that we that I. I program i played with was ran through embry riddle he he helped kind of start it oh that's awesome as, yeah and it was great and so you know it's I, I played with his son his oldest son coached me his other older older son coached me as well like they all went through the program i was able to be a part of uh you know a part of that organization for seven or eight years uh playing and then coaching and developing a relationship with him i worked at summer camps uh, I was the leader at his summer camps. He just, it was great because the, the older I got and the more I spent time around him, the more opportunities he gave me. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. It's kind and of like it giving never, you a little bit more and more. <laughs> exactly. And it was never really coaching because he didn't coach the middle school organization. He had one of his really co- close friends who's another mentor of mine who was the coach there. He coached it, but, but Coach Ritter was always around. And I got through middle school and he said, what do you, you know, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I really want to come back and coach. And he said, that's, you know, you should absolutely do that. And, and I came back and I would coach and every now and then after practice and after games, he would stop, we'd sit in the bleachers and just talk. And, and it was really, you know, what are you, what are you seeing out there as a coach? What is coach Hardy? Who is my coach? What does he have you looking for? What do you want to look for? He really started kind of developing my mind for how to see the floor as a coach and how to see it as an assistant coach, which I I think are two very different things. And I Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's talked about enough. The assistant coach has to see the game almost in a completely different way. The head coach has to see it in certain aspects, I think. And so he would always talk to me about that. And, you know, you're 14 and 15 and you answer some questions. We don't really know yet. You're still kind of developing in a lot of ways. And, and then I would come to his camps and he would say, you know, I need you to do this for me. 
okay, I need you to do the book for me. Okay, you're going to do the book and the clock for this game. And then I need you to come over this game and I need you to run camera. And then I do that and then, it, okay, it's the championship high school game. You're going to do the book and the clock. Okay, cool. And then I'd come back the next year and it was, hey, we've got a bunch of people that are running the book and the clock. Can you oversee them and just make sure everybody's doing what they need to do? Yeah, sure, I can do that. And you just never really you don't you don't even think about it like the great mentors teach you and you don't even know what's happening um and i just man i just had that relationship with him for seven or eight years and it was awesome and uh stayed in touch with him and still st still stay in touch with his family i swap emails with his son ryan who's at ut martin like i said I, you know i still talk with him and you know, if I have anything to say about it, he'll kind of start sliding into one of those mentor <laughs> slots and not even know it. Um, but yeah, that was really my first one. Him uh, and Coach Hardy were really my great first one ones at a very young age, which is great for me. I hit the jackpot with them being my yeah. first ones. I mean, it's just, it's probably one of those things, right? Like you said, where it's just like, you didn't even really think about it at the time until you look back and you're like, wow, I had this resource here like this whole time you don't you don't even think about it until you, you know we were, we were talking off camera a little bit kind of about what our our my first year situation is with with the school mm -hmm. and and i called back to drills that we ran <laughs> in middle school because i'm i have middle schoolers on my team because we're k through 12 and and we don't have enough kids for a jv team so we're varsity only i've got some middle schoolers on my varsity team i haven't dealt with middle schoolers in a decade plus <laughs> um and we got on the floor and it just immediately it was like a wave of every drill I ever ran when I was in sixth grade just hit me all at once. <laughs> and I just Flashback. started laughing. <laughs> I just started laughing on the court. I was like, man, they got me. They they did it. They 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 put it in my head and it stuck there. And I didn't need it for 10 years, but the moment I needed it, it came right to the forefront of my head. I mean that's that, that's that's some good coaching that that you had then if that stuck with you after all that time. Oh that's yeah, awesome. it was all on them. Yeah, yeah, no, but that was really my those were my first two mentors really out of the gate and and still have the opportunity to to know them and and be friends with them, you know, even even after all these years and they're still very prevalent in my life, which is great. That's awesome, and I and yeah. I'm and I'm curious because when you have like such um, great people to go to advice or go for advice to and you, and you got these people of wealth of information and knowledge it's it's probably hard maybe and i'll let you speak to this sometimes to like try and think about what your own path is going to be as a coach and ways that you might deviate from you know what what your mentors do or try to kind of carve your own way that might not be lockstep with something that like a, your your mentor would have suggested or you think your mentor would have done so I was curious about how you kind of balance using your mentors, but also your own personal journey of self-discovery and, and carving your own path as a coach as well. Yeah, I, I think uh, the biggest thing that you can do as a coach, especially in a newer coach, is you, you have to be able to take in the things that your mentors are saying but you also have to spend enough time around the game to understand that you every every coach brings their own certain i don't know vibe to the game i don't know you bring your own certain personality to it that's a better word you bring your own certain personality to the game and you can't lose that mm -hmm. right my you know my first big mentor what you know my first two really mentors that I still talk to and they still have a great effect on my life are both college coaches. Okay. Well, college coaches act very differently than high school coaches, especially in game <laughs> and particularly not only just college to high school, but particularly what they're going through versus what I'm going through. Yeah. Right. So I have to understand that. And, and coaches do, you have to understand that you're going to have your own personality to it. I am going to, laugh and joke with my kids right that's just I, i'm I, I try and be i try and be a very a, a much more laid back coach not not to say that i don't you know we're always gonna have our moments but mm -hmm. I, I try not to be a coach that's constantly yelling or nagging because when i i've had games like that i've had games this year like that and as soon as i come off the court i know i did something wrong 
I just, you, it's that thing as a coach, you just feel in the pit of your stomach that you just, you just didn't do it well that night, you know? And so that might work for the other coaches. The, uh, you know, my other mentors are very, they are, they're very dynamic. They're very to the point. They're very, you know, they're, they're, they're fiery. Yeah. Um, and, and that's just not me. That's me at some points when I need to be, but as a whole, I don't really think that is me. And, and that's one of those things where you realize don't be somebody else. You have to learn how to be you. And that just comes with hours on the bench and hours in the gym and hours in front of kids. You can write down in a notebook who you want to be as a coach. And, and by the way, I think that exercise is great. I do that, but it's only until you can put it into practice that you start to really form what you're going to be as a coach and, and who you're going to be as a coach. So for my mentors, I look mostly for how did they build their culture? And then I will look at kind of X's and O's things that they do to see if that's something that I can teach or if I can take that and repackage it or repurpose it into something else that I like and build onto it. But for me, the biggest things that I look at are always culture and environment. How did they build that? What do they do? How do they treat their players on the court? How do they treat them off the court? All those types of things. So what did you learn from culture that you're currently using right now? I learned that it doesn't matter what any coach ever says. It always starts with you. <laughs> it's not... It's not the kid's fault. It's not the AD's fault. It's not the assistant's fault that you brought over, right? It's not your schedule's fault. It's not that you got put in a tough conference when you don't think you should have been or a tough district when you don't think you should have been and that screwed you over and now that's why you went, you know, 10 and 15 instead of, you know, 19 and 6 or whatever. Um, I learned that accountability and culture – Culture starts with you, the head coach, and it starts with accountability. And the first thing it is, is accountability to yourself and making sure that every day when you come in, you are creating that atmosphere of what you want that culture to be. And then the buy-in happens. I think so many times coaches expect buy-in to happen on day one. That will never be a thing. You might have some kids that are more inviting to you on day one than others, but full buy-in probably doesn't happen in year one, <laughs> much less in, in day one or month one. Um, you know, I, I'm the eighth coach in seven years or the seventh coach in eight years at my yeah, school. I'm saying that I'm not going to get buy-in. I don't even have buy-in now we're at our break and I know I don't yet, but that's okay. It's not the kid's fault. These kids are 14 years old 18 years old like they don't understand this yet it's my job <laughs> to show them that and for mm -hmm. me as a coach to put that on them is wrong and it it doesn't it doesn't make anybody better um so that was the biggest thing that i learned in culture is one it, everything starts with me everything everything starts with me does the bus have gas in it did the food get there on time do they have their jerseys? If they don't have their jerseys, I didn't do a good job, a good enough job of explaining the importance of having your jersey, right? You just have to take ownership for everything and work through it that way. And if you work through it in that lens, you start to lay that found work, that you start to lay that foundation and lay that groundwork. Um and I think that that's kind of something where, you know, things may be a little bit different where you can't nest necessarily be a hundred percent in lockstep with your, your mentor because because again your mentors probably are not walking into exactly the same type of situation that you are of so many coaches and so many years previous to you exactly a hundred percent you know they don't they may have had a similar situation but they're not in the same situation that i'm in so i can i can take some things from them but also one of the things that you have to learn and and you just have to understand that some of these things you're going to learn on your own, right? As it happens. Mm -hmm. And you can have the best mentors in the world and you're just going to have to learn it in the moment with nobody around you. And you're just going to have to make a decision and go with it. And the two things that I learned were the culture starts with me and me only. And I have to 
love my kids to an incredible level so that they see it every day. Yeah. Those are the only two things I've taken from, not the only two things. Those are the two biggest things I've taken from my mentors and everything else on a day-to-day basis. I'm pulling small things, but, but a lot of the times you're just learning on your own and you, you make a decision based on the cultures built. The culture starts with me. And am I loving my kids to the nth degree every single day? Right. And that, and then that leads me to, uh asking you, and I, I think I can kind of tell the answer be, uh, based on what you just said about uh, some mistakes that maybe you feel that you would have made had you not listened to advice from your mentors. What what are some some faults or some things that maybe you thought, oh, I probably would have, maybe I could have seen myself tripping up or, or not going about things the right way if I if I didn't take this advice from, from my mentors? I I would have tried to become a head coach much earlier. And I think that would have been a mistake. I was, I was a head coach for a JV boys team for a couple of years, but I was, I was still under somebody's organization, right? I was, I was a head coach for that team, but it was still based and structured around the organization of the varsity coach. Um, and, and I think that was a good way for me to get my foot, you know, dip my toes in the water, get my foot in the door. Uh, and I learned a lot there. But I think I would have tried to become a varsity head coach earlier. Mm-hmm. And I think that would have been bad because there's a lot of stuff organizationally you have to at least be aware of before you get into that world for the first time. Um, I would have tried to have done it probably five or six years ago. And I think now was much better timing. So I think that's probably one of the, one of the first mistakes I would have made uh, I think handling handling practices, I would have handled practices worse. And any any coach can coach a team when everybody comes in and they're hitting every shot and everybody's locked in, right? We've all had that practice. Everybody comes in, the kids are on fire and they're just locked into everything you're saying. It's like they're finally retaining all of it, right? Mm-hmm. and they can't miss anything they're making all the right passes they're doing everything they need to do yeah. <laughs> in that practice it's That'd amazing great. Oh, yeah everybody Best can coach, coach ever that. right exactly right you're like man i've got this this job is not nearly as hard as people make it out to be i don't know why everybody's complaining so much right and then the next day <laughs> a couple people show up late uh nobody's making anything two kids got in a you know, are mad at each other over some, something, but they're on the team. So they have to practice together. And it's just, everybody on the team wants to be anywhere in the, anywhere in the world, but the gym that you're currently standing in. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? How do you have that day without absolutely just teeing off on the kids and, and making it just, and just taking what's an already, unsettled atmosphere and making it worse I think would have been something I would have done rather now it's okay I I know this practice what can we do to 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 get the kids the information they need today and the workout they need today but try and make it as productive and as positive as possible try to keep them as engaged and pos- as possible So you scrap some drills and you go to more team shooting or partner shooting or, or do you go from partner shooting to full team workout? You know, you got to be able to read the room on a dime too Mm. and see what's going on. And, and I think I would have screwed that up a lot. And I think I would have lost a lot of locker rooms along the way. Um, Especially, especially at an earlier age, if I wouldn't have waited until now. Yeah, I mean, if you if you aren't aware of that, the fact that you know sometimes those practices are just not going to be where you want them to be. I, I can definitely see myself when I was really younger, like kind of hitting the panic button, right, mm-hmm. and be like, "Wait a minute, what's going?" And then like trying to get on them and, and get real, get real fiery and get real upset and everything, and instead of realizing that that's just kind of the ups and downs and normal progression of working with young people is that some days are just going to be those days where everything is happening where they're not 
focused on basketball and, and that happens. And, and instead of getting upset and riled up and angry and throwing chairs and everything to kind of have to, like you said, right, be able to quickly adjust to it and, and still have a positive and, and productive practice anyway. Exactly. Yeah. How do you, how do you teach them through that? And how do you, instead of avoiding the moment, how do you take that moment in your hand? and show everybody what's happening instead of like, Oh, we're having a really bad practice, but never mentioning it. Blow the whistle and mention it. Hey guys, we're having a really terrible practice right now. Mm -hmm. Right. Take that awkward moment. <laughs> I would have never done that. You know, now you, you gather, you blow the whistle, you gather everybody up and you go, Hey, practice really sucks right now. <laughs> what's going on. And not like practice sucks. What's going on. I can't believe you guys. No, no genuinely asking like what's happening what, yeah. what's going on they're kids I they tell break you. up with somebody is a parent fighting somebody pass failed a class failed a test it could be a million different things they're high school kids right and 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 that's another thing too i would have forgotten earlier that i was dealing with high school kids and i would have tried to teach them like grown-ups which you can't do you, you just can't do that. They're high school kids. They're in school. They're growing up. They're going through all these different changes in life and in them and in their families and in sports and in class and all these other things. How do you just, how do you teach them? I always said when, when someday came, I was going to write a book called life lessons through basketball. And, uh, how do you, how do you take that moment as a life lesson and say, don't avoid it. Don't run from it. Today isn't going well. Why isn't it going well? Mm -hmm. And address it. And don't tell them to address it in front of the whole team. Some kids might not want to do that. And I don't think that's my place to be like, hey, throw your business on the table. I'm definitely not going to do that. But give them 60 seconds. Why is today not going well for you? Is it something really serious? Do you need to talk to a coach? Do you need to talk to uh, an advisor, a counselor? You know, do you yeah. need to talk to somebody on campus? Like, is there really something going on? Did you just fail a test? Did you just miss an assignment? You know, what is it? And, and give them 60 seconds to think about it. Give them an opportunity to try and work it, work themselves through it, or at least be able to come to grips with it. And then try and get back into practice. And, and maybe you make the practice lighter. Maybe, maybe it was a day of implementation at the beginning of the year because you need to get a bunch of stuff in there. And it just wasn't working and maybe it just becomes a shooting practice or a shooting and a passing practice or whatever it has to be. You can't beat it. You can't beat their heads into the wall. Sometimes you, you have to be able to scale back and you have to be able to look and read the room and understand what we're doing today just isn't going to work, but how do we get through it? And I think that that's, that's something that I, I, try to keep in the back of my mind that I have like this little log in the in the back of my mind. I do think I'd have it physically written down somewhere, but it's kind of a good tool maybe for coaches to consider having is to have like a list of things in practice that either your players like to do or they're pretty successful at doing or can find success doing in, whether it's like shooting drills or passing drills or just anything that like they can be successful in and maybe throw those in when practices aren't going well. So at least they're doing something that they're kind of comfortable with and kind of can do well. And maybe, maybe they just need to, you know, to see that sort of success because things outside of the basketball court are really stressful for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I think it's, I think it's necessary as coaches to, to write things down. I have a, I have, you know, you can ask my wife, I have four or five different notebooks that contain something to do with basketball. And I know what they are, but if an outsider looked in there, I would look like a crazy person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think as coaches, we have to be a little crazy for this job. I, so, I, you know, yeah. we, I know what it is. But if somebody would be like, why do you have six basketball notebooks? I'd be like, well, this is this and this is this and this is this. But I think it's, I think it's very important to write things down, especially as a newer coach. I was just talking to somebody the other day. Actually, it's funny you bring that up. I just had my, my first opportunity to really kind of half mentor somebody, I guess. Somebody reached out and, and asked me a question. And the first thing I told them was get a notebook, get two notebooks. <laughs> the first notebook is during practice and during games, when you're on the bench, what's happening? What are you seeing? What is the coach doing? The second notebook is anytime you're watching a game on TV, regardless of level, write stuff down that you like, write stuff down that you don't like. Mm -hmm. 
and that was the that was the first piece of advice I gave him. Nice. Look at yeah. like look at that already already get shelling that out. Trying to. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, what what role has your uh, mentors played uh, so far in, in this season for you as you've been navigating such a unique situation that that you've been in? Yeah, I uh, there there's another gentleman that I, I had the opportunity of being my mentor um, when I was I sat on on his staff in college for a year, a little over a year. Um, he is now the, an assistant coach for the women's team at, uh, at, uh, Colorado. Uh, his name is Tim Hayes. Uh, awesome, awesome guy learned just a ton of, he was the first mentor I had when I was fully, not, not fully, when I was fully grown, I you know, I'm in my twenties, mm -hmm. not fully grown, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I really had the opportunity to just talk basketball and talk shop with him. And, and that got to a bunch of different levels for me because I was I was finally able to understand a lot more. I wasn't able to understand some of the stuff because I think you're always growing. But uh, for him, it was really interesting because I had a chance to talk with him about starting a program. Because when I sat on his bench, it was his first year at the school I was at. Mm. And he had just come in. There was a the coach before him had left. There was, there was success there, but it, they didn't quite get there. And sure. um, he came in and immediately turned the program around. I think while he was there, he lost – gosh, he was there for five years and I think lost less than 10 games. He didn't lose a conference game, I think, in regular season um, while he was there. And so really turned the program around and there were championship contenders, Final Four contenders multiple years. Uh, at the NAI level and learned from him that uh, obviously it's the college level. So you kind of have to scale how you think about certain things from high school to college. But I really learned from him that, you know, no matter where you find the program that you get into, you can lay the groundwork for success immediately, knowing you can lay the groundwork for success immediately. Mm -hmm knowing that it might not pay off till three years down the road, right? He was the first conversation I had where I looked at a program as a long-term thing. Not everybody just gets to come in year one and win 28 games and go to the national championship. I get be that. Nice. <laughs> it would be great. It would be awesome. But for, for him, and, and he basically did that his first year he was there, um, he's just an, an insanely great coach and, and a great guy. But he really talked about instances he had and people that he had worked with where it was really laying the groundwork for that long-term success, uh, which was just a huge thing to talk about with him and one of the things that I brought in. And uh, especially because he was the women's coach, that was really where I got a wealth of knowledge of how do you how do you successfully be a male coach in a women's sport? Mm -hmm. What do I need to do to make sure that I do everything the proper way? Okay, you need to have a female assistant. And these were all these things he was telling me. This is what the female assistant always takes care of. This, 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 and this. This is her roles outside of the game for this reason and this reason and this reason and this reason. And then when you get to game day, she's going to help you with this and with that and and I got a ton of information, a, a wealth of information from him on, on, on how to properly navigate being a male coach in, in a female sport and doing it the right way and doing it with the same amount of passion and love, but understanding that those kids, no matter what is going on, can absolutely 100% trust you and they don't even have to think about it. Right. It's just, yeah. do you trust coach Cameron? Yes. Right. You, that's the point you want to get to and here are steps you can take in that world to be able to do that. Yeah. I mean, that's so interesting that I think you would need, there's just so many things that I just, as I think back on my own Kurt coaching journey, right. That, that you just didn't know that you didn't know. Oh, man. Right? right. There's just so much <laughs> about that, that you don't know. And I think that, one of the things I get from from your answer that is is why I think having a mentor is so important is I think that we get 
into coaching when we're really young and, and get the idea of uh, coaching because of how much we love the game of basketball and, and, and how much we love, you know, teaching the game of basketball. But as you know, and as you've said in a lot of your answers that you've given, a lot of this that you've kind of taken in is, is, is about so much more than what's happening on a basketball court, but just building a program and working with people in general. And I think that having a mentor who's been through that and, and, and has done that can can just give you so much great advice and keep you from a bunch of, of, of pitfalls that, that just come from not knowing and not having that experience of, of working with a lot of people or, or building something that's greater than yourself. I could not agree with you more. I, I, yeah. And it's, and it's really, I, you know, I've had a great opportunity that I'll, two of the mentors that I really, really look up to are, are at a level above me. Yeah. So I learned a lot of stuff from how they saw things. And it is many different things than just a basketball team, right? I learned from them that if you want to build a successful program, mm -hmm. right, an environment, a culture, a program, maybe 20% of it is going to be basketball as you're building the culture. The 80% is going to be getting the right kids in there, loving on the kids, doing doing things to get the kids to become a team and get creating an atmosphere and environment in which the kids want to do that and want to succeed. That's part of building the culture. That is probably 20% basketball, maybe less. Now, when you want to get from the culture to the product on the court, then it flips. Right. Then it's, you know, everything X's and O's and mechanically and your thoughts and how you want to draw things up and how you want to code things. That is where that becomes a thing is when you look at on the court, which I think, again, I've had the ability based on who I've talked to, to be able to disconnect the two. There is culture and then there is product. And if you want to build the culture, it is not nearly as much about the product as people think it is. Mm -hmm. that's for the product side. That's for the on-court side is for the product side, building the culture, building that family, building that, those relationships, that organization almost has nothing to do with the X's and O's of on the court. Yeah. And I think that's one of the beauties about not starting right away as a head coach is that typically if you're on the assistant side of things, you can maybe, just focus more on the basketball part and then kind of take in and learn about all the other aspects and kind of gradually build yourself up to the point where you're ready to take over and lead a program. Yeah. One of the, one of the biggest things for me that I look back on is the fact that I did not start as a head coach and yeah. that while I was a JV boys head coach and I knew some JV boys head coaches that kept their own win loss record, which was the whole other whole other set of stories we can go through <laughs> are people you meet along the way but i'm like i don't really think you need your win loss in your bio as a jv coach but you do you buddy uh you know i had the opportunity to do that which which gave me a lot of insight in a it gave me a brand new insight to a lot of things the majority of my time as a coach in basketball has been as an assistant and i think it's massive i think everybody should start as the fourth chair assistant and then try to work their way up to the first chair assistant and then try and get that coaching job. Yeah. And I think just, just to put a bow on that, that also helps you, right. As a coach, know what you want to look for in your own assistants because you've been through it yourself. Yes. A hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. Every, every coach knows kind of what they want to look for in an assistant. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that, you know, as you know, and you just said is created by how you went through it we see the assistance through the lens of how we were as assistants Yep, because we know what we want in that a hundred percent. Absolutely. Absolutely. So as you start to, you know, think about the future and, and where your coaching career uh, hopefully, you know, takes you where it is you want to go. What are some ways that you see yourself uh, continuing to rely on, on your mentors and turn to your mentors in the near future? Are there maybe some situations you see coming up in the near future or, or things that, you anticipate happening where, where you think your, your mentors in particular are going to be helpful for you? Yeah, I, I really do. I think that, um, I think my mentors will be very helpful for me 
as I continue to to grow as a coach and obviously at the high school level, I mean, you know, you never really know who's going to walk through your doors at a year by year basis. You could have two kids transfer out. You could have three kids transfer in that you've never met before. You know, you just, you really just don't know. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things relying on them would be, okay, how do you operate bringing in a new player to an established culture or environment? How do you, how do you bring them in and make that as fluid as possible uh, and make it as easy as possible? And how do you let them know early the, the culture, the expectations of the culture and the environment and, and bring them in? I think that'll be something I'm, I look forward to a bridge. I look forward to crossing with them in that. The other thing too, I think the, the more I get settled into this program uh, and the the more my kids come along and the more competitive we get is finally getting to a point where I can talk X's and O's with them and yeah. start drawing things up. And this is what I see. And, and what do you think? And, and, you know, getting their, getting their takes on certain things and, and really starting to develop and hone my own philosophy as a coach offensively and defensively with my playbook. Because I think that's also something that grows. And when you first start out as a head coach, you have certain ideals. But a lot of the stuff you have in a playbook is things you just borrowed from other people that you know right. or other things you saw, which is great. I, every coach steals from every coach, right? That's, you know, everybody knows that. And I think it's great. Guilty. I think you should do that. <laughs> exactly. I think, I think it's great and I think it should be done. But the, the more you, you are uh, in your head coaching role, the more – your system will start to show itself and what you want to do and how you want to coach and how you want them to play and those X's and O's and those very specific things. So the, the further I go with this, the more excited I am to have those kind of conversations with them where it's dry, dry erase markers at the whiteboard kind of thing and drawing stuff up and, and talking scenarios and situations and, and plays and such. Be, yeah. I mean, that, that'll be fun to really be, you know, get, get, getting the playbook out and really getting into some X's and O's stuff. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's awesome. I, I think that'd be really cool to like really just have that like X's and O's basketball conversation and, 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 you know, talk as like peers almost and talking about hoops like that. That'd be, that'd be great. I think it's, I think that's huge. And, and I think it's a big thing for mentees that moment that your mentors see you as that peer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it's huge. And I think it's a, it's a big moment as a mentee to be seen as that, that peer by them. But, but uh, you know, and, and that's going to be great. I'm going to love that. But a lot of the other conversations are going to be those difficult, you know, how do you deal with the, the incoming players or, you know, how do you deal with these certain kind of things that are going on in your organization as you grow yeah. uh, are going to be great conversations too. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I agree with you on, on that 100%. Uh, before we hit our concluding segment, I did want to actually ask you this really quickly because I, I almost forgot to, and that is um, if there are any like younger coaches out there who might uh, not quite know what to look for or know whether or not somebody's going to be a good mentor to them, what, what advice would you give to maybe a younger coach and what they should look for uh, in, in a mentor to make sure that it's somebody who, who's really going to help them in their journey? Man, that's a really great question. I look for somebody that is excited to help people. Mm. I think there are there are coaches that are just kind of, they're there and they show up and they do what they need to do and then they leave until they have to show up again. Find the coach that is willing to stay after that is willing to answer those questions for you, that you can just look at them and tell they they care about people genuinely and they, they care about what they're doing and they're willing to help people because those are the coaches that will give you those, you know, those midnight answers and those, those, those long conversations about really almost anything – to do with anything but basketball (laughs) and the very start and, you know, philosophical ideas on, on how to treat people and how to handle people and, and, and look for coaches that are willing to give those answers and that are willing to have those conversations 
those will be the coaches that will be you can glean the most from i would think would be i would say would be a a big a big thing for me that i would look for uh go you know if you're in, if you're in the area and you're looking to find somebody go watch their games yeah. go see their mannerisms live i mean coaches go scout players all the time right what do they do they sneak into the gym and they look <laughs> to see how they're playing right how are they operating yeah. with their teammates how are they operating with the refs how are they operating when they're losing or when they're winning sure if you're looking for a mentor do the same thing with a coach get in the gym see how they see how they operate when they're winning see how they operate when they're losing see how they talk to the kids um i think that's i think that's very telling of really good coaches as well yeah, I know. I like that a lot. You know, go, 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 go do your research, right? Go to go scout. Go scout. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Go. Why not start your scouting journey early? Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Coach, to wrap up, there's a couple of questions I ask every guest. I'll go ahead and start uh, here with this first one, which is thinking back to your coaching career. Uh, mm -hmm. What is a moment from your coaching career that you think others listening will be able to learn from? Um, <laughs> well, I, so I'll give you the funny one first. I, I led the state in technicals one year because my book was wrong for the first three games. <laughs> so always have the book, right? <laughs> always have the names and numbers corresponded to the right names and numbers. Uh, so there's a, there's a technical answer you can learn from. Um, looking back on it, I, I had, uh, I would love to be able to talk to people if they're going to ask me this question about dealing with parents hmm. and how to deal with high school kids parents as a basketball coach and how to understand having certain conversations with them especially when you're a younger coach and they are older than you are and they are going to try and play the older card I think you have to be able to have a nice balance of answering those questions you know, nicely and respectfully, but, but also not kind of backing down from some of those conversations yeah. and then learning from it and understanding how parents of kids in high school are going to think and really getting into their brain and understanding what, where they're coming from and trying to bridge that gap. Mm. That's it. I'm, 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 I can't, don't, don't, Pardon my laugh here, but I have to have, I have to follow up about the the book though. What what happened with the book? <laughs> I it was when I was a JV coach, and it was at a school where uh, it was a it was a nine through twelve school, and you had to keep everybody that tried out for JV. I couldn't cut my first year I was there. It was a smaller private school. They were like, "You're not going to have a lot of kids," but you know, we just our policy is we don't cut parents. You know pay for their kids to come here. If they want to play a sport, they're going to play a sport. You know, we don't, we don't have that rule for varsity, but we have that rule for JV. So everybody can get playing time, but don't worry. You're not going to have a lot of kids. Um, so don't worry about it. I was like, okay, cool. I walk in there, 18 kids. So I carried 18 kids my first year as a JV coach and all of them pretty much had to play for the most part. Yeah. I ended up I ended up dressing more kids than our football team did the last game of its season. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so when you have 18 kids and you're trying to scrounge for jerseys from different wow. years <laughs> because you don't have a full 18 jersey set uh, and kids have to trade numbers for one reason or the other, or you lose a jersey, so you have to bring another one out there to try and make sure you don't have duplicate numbers. Uh, it was, it was, it was rough, and it was the first time I was ever really a head coach of any team, and it's just one of those small things that you kind of forget. I appreciate you being willing to share it, though. I don't know if I would. I don't know if I, I, I would have had the had the courage to sh share that. <laughs> oh, but I, I made my mistakes on the book that too. Story. No, that's funny, though. No, that's yeah. Got to be able to laugh it. Yeah, now spiritual. you can look back on it and sort of laugh at the thing, right? For sure. Yeah, you can't laugh at what you did wrong sometimes. You yeah, know? it's just it's gonna be a tough life. You got. Hey, that's good at. advice. If you want to mentor somebody, make sure you can yeah. laugh off and talk about your mistakes that you've made, and and, and have, have a good. Uh, 
good smile on your face through some of them, you know, and just, just be willing to share those mistakes too. Cause we can learn a lot from our mentors mistakes that they've made along the way as well. Mm, absolutely. To wrap yeah, up coach. Definitely. I give every guest what I call a 60 second soapbox. It's your platform to get out kind of your final thought, closing message, closing idea, something you want to leave the listeners with. I'm not going to even time you. So you can go over 60 seconds if you want as well, but <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and give you the floor and uh, I'm just going to kind of let you take it from here. So, so go have at it coach. Oh man, a 60 second soapbox. I love it. Um, I going back to the coaching and the coaches, I think we, uh, <clears throat> don't be afraid to, to, uh, we're just having a conversation with that, about this with somebody. Don't be afraid to kind of go outside the box here and start thinking about different things, because I don't know if there was a horns summit or convention that every coach in America signed up for to do it. But I feel like we all run the same horns sets <laughs> and after a while, like don't be afraid to branch out. You know, I just thought that was, I just thought that was funny because I do the same thing. And, and I say that not as to shoot anybody down. I have my own set. Um, I just thought it was funny that like one day it just appeared. It's like all of us were programmed like the matrix. We all just woke up with that knowledge in our head or something. Hey, maybe, I mean, you know, during, during COVID, we probably all went to the same coaching Zoom clinics, right? Picked <laughs> up on was. the same things. And, and then we're like, oh, we're going to use that next year. And it's like, oh, you went to that clinic too, huh? <laughs> yeah, it was it was really funny. We were, I was, we were playing a team the other night and he called the horn set. And I was like, they're going to pass and cut away and look at the corner and just, just map it all out for him. Yeah, there. you just yeah, knew what go. it was, and and uh, you were yeah. you were coaching their offense from from the I'm, other side, right? <laughs> yeah, I kind of feel bad doing that. I I feel that's also another thing too. Like I feel like you need to know when you can call out certain things you're seeing and when you're just kind of being a jerk. And I think when you coach the opposing offense through their play, that might be like the line of being a jerk. I'm not entirely sure yet. I'm still working through that, but. Um, well, I just did that know. this past weekend. So uh, <laughs> I don't know. Did uh -oh. you feel? How did you feel about that? I don't know because uh, I, I kind of felt like my defense needed to know what was going on, but also I didn't want him to take it the wrong way. But like I knew uh, what my, he was doing. Uh, my thought. Mm, I right? mean, yeah. my thought is 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 like if hopefully you have a counter. Hopefully, if something you can put <laughs> against this. If I got this, like yeah. I would, I would like to hope as a coach if somebody just could script and and re relay, you know my offense to to their defense that I, I could have some wrinkle or some variation or something else I could go to. Yeah. I think too, also throw, uh, uh, and I'll kind of go back to the soapbox yeah. on this too, uh, throw your personality in there as a coach. Like don't be afraid to hide your personality. Perfect example. I told my kids at the beginning of the year, here are the plays that we're running. Here's our inbounds play. It's called box, right? So it's not like very, you know, ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, you know, it's not very, descriptive but i was like at some point i am going to start saying words that make no sense to anything just run the initial play that i called and don't listen to anything i'm saying and i said this in the beginning of the year and they're like uh okay so we're six games in we're running box we run it four times in a row and we scored every single time and we go, the ball goes out of bounds. It's our ball underneath. I call box. The opposing coach calls a timeout, right? So this kind of goes back to the horns thing, right? So he calls a timeout and he goes, I know exactly what they're going to run. Come over here. We're going to draw it up. He said this in the gym, right? It's not a small gym. I heard what he said. <laughs> so I'm dying laughing because he has to call a timeout to diagram my play to his kids, which I just, a pat on the back to me. Yeah, heck yeah. Really nice. So I bring my kids over and I go, we're running box forget about everything I say for the next 20 seconds. And they all just kind of chuckled because they remembered the call back to the original, the original uh, practice when they're like, okay. And so we get on the thing and I'm like, you know, I was like, we're running box. And they're like, okay. So they get out on the court and I just start, I'm like, we're running orange to Sally. I don't have a Sally, <laughs> but I was like, we're running orange. I was like, make it orange slant, Sally, make it orange slant. And they're like, coach, we got it. And uh, ran the same exact play and scored the same exact layup. We scored off him four times. <laughs> that is awesome. And yeah, that is, and that, he called it too. He drew it up exactly how I called it. It was hilarious. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, 
Sometimes you just got to throw your personality in there, man. You just, you can't be afraid to have fun. Sometimes it's a game. It's a game for kids. You got to be able to laugh through it and have yeah. some fun with it. That's a great that's a great way to to end off at. Awesome, uh, Coach. I want to thank you for coming on here, talking about your mentors, talking about uh, your coaching journey, and all the advice you've gotten from your mentors, along with your own personality and style you've thrown in there along the way. I know that you are. In a very unique situation right now, but I know you got some uh, good guidance to help you along there, and and I know you're gonna establish a pretty awesome culture and 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 have, do some great things out over there in Florida. So, Coach, thank you so much. Best of luck the rest of the way, and and really appreciate you coming on here to talk. Thank you. I appreciate I appreciate you having me, and I want to give you your flowers too. I appreciate what you do and giving coaches a platform to speak on and talk about things and help develop the community and the the coaching culture. So, appreciate what you do as well. Thank you very much. Thank you all for listening. This was another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast, and we will see you guys next time. Thank you for listening to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Make sure to connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, or reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Take care, be safe, and we'll see you next time.